Welcome to Law Matters, a show exploring current issues of social relevance. I'm your host, Jennifer Varsley. Today we're exploring the interesting issue of workplace diversity and looking at how this can be dealt with moving forward and potential solutions to the diversity problem. Understanding the impact of diversity initiatives is crucial to future policy changes and to the question of whether we should see legislative reform in this area. But when we ask questions of diversity, it raises the issue of well, what does this mean? You know, what are we trying to achieve and how will this impact university or organizational success? In this regard, we are beginning to see more data in these areas linking increased diversity to increased business performance and better results for companies and universities alike. In this regard, most recent reports have stated that women in the sciences in particular continue to be underrepresented in these fields and in the progression from lower levels to higher levels of science or to professorship. And when we look at this, it then deserves us to understand why this is the case. So in looking at the underlying issues for why retention rates are poor, why promotion rates are not as they should be, and why we're not hiring enough people into these fields at the outset. To gauge public opinion on diversity initiatives, we asked people about their views on this topic. It depends on which sector, which industry. I mean, if it's care work, definitely. If it's something like a bank or anything like that, I don't think you can get as far as they should be able to. Uh, well, in the workplace I was formerly in, before I retired, I was a solicitor, uh, and certainly in my firm they did. Uh, and we judge people purely on their abilities uh, and on nothing else. Whether women have equal opportunity in other spheres, uh, I rather doubt, if, if, just on reading the, the papers. But certainly as a lawyer, more, there are more women lawyers than there are men qualified. So I certainly think in the legal profession, I don't see why not. It, where I work? Yeah, I think that's true, yes. But there aren't many women where I work because I'm a software developer and it's not a field that attracts, well, women. But we've also got some traders, female traders, and they're also successful, also quite high up in the company. So there's potential, lots of opportunity for them to succeed. I think um, not always. Um, I think um, that's a really sad thing. Um, and I think um, particularly after the week we've had, um, actually it, it should be a thing I'm really passionate about. Um, and so I think probably not always, um, but, but in a lot of places um, it's growing, it's getting better. To assist us in understanding how this issue and the related challenges will be dealt with moving forward, we'll be speaking with Dr. Nita Faruhi of the University of Cambridge. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure, thank you. So to begin with, for the benefit of our viewers, why do you think diversity is such an important topic? Diversity is crucial to our success as a society because our society is made up of all the diverse elements of be it gender, be it ethnicity, be it pe people of different ages, backgrounds. So we celebrate diversity because uh, partly it is about social justice, uh, it's also about getting equality and also we achieve the greatest success when we have buy-in and contributions from everyone, all sectors of our society. Absolutely, I think that makes a great deal of sense. Um, and then when we look at you know, recruitment decisions, some people would say we should just be focusing on who is the best candidate for the job and maybe put diversity considerations aside. Mm -hmm. How would you deal with a, a comment like that? Okay, so um, recruitment is uh, a complex process and one could make the argument for both sides of, of, of that uh, equation, as in uh, you do want the best candidate on merit, somebody who will deliver the job to the best of their ability and is best qualified, but equally there are sections of our society that have traditionally been weaker or have been disadvantaged, so there is this concept of course of positive discrimination and should we follow it. Now, in Cambridge, one of the things we've been doing through the Athena Swan process is to improve our recruitment practices by 
training the staff who are going to be on recruitment panels to be aware of equality and diversity issues. We require all our staff who are on panels to do equality and diversity training. And this can be done in an easy online module. Uh, and I've personally done it. It's really, really helpful in making you aware of those issues of fairness, of justice, and of bearing those issues in mind. And also, we get training on unconscious bias. And that's really important because we all have unknown biases, unconscious biases, and by being more aware of them, we can practice better and more fair recruitment. So getting recruitment right is really, really important. Mm, that's really good to know. And then do you think we need regulation in this area or is this an area where organizations or universities can do the right thing? So if we go back to the Athena Swan, let me take you back to that. Um, it, this is not based on regulation. This is based ultimately as an equality charter uh, from the Equality Challenge Unit uh, at the higher education uh, bodies, uh, essentially universities and uh, higher education institutions. And rather than going for regulation as in law, uh, this process works really by incentives. So for instance, for the medical schools, clinical schools up and down the UK, the chief medical officer, Dame Sally Davis, uh, in 2011, she came up with a really clever scheme, which was unless the medical schools show an effort and progress towards gender equality, uh, they would not be eligible for applying for big funding from the National Institutes of Health Research, NIHR. And for Cambridge alone, that would be equivalent of more than 100 million pounds of funding, which you couldn't even apply for. You would not be eligible unless you engaged with the gender equality in this case, in the case of the Athena Swan Charter. And have you seen the impact of this due to these incentives? Well, it's uh, early days because this was introduced in 2011. We got our first uh, silver award at the clinical school because the Athena Swan program works as an incentive scheme, which is a charter which is linked to a bronze level, a silver level or a gold level award. And I'm very happy to report that in 2013, at our first attempt at the clinical school, we got a silver award. Uh, and the university as a whole also holds a silver award. So we are delighted with that, but that's not just a box ticking exercise about, oh, now we can apply for funding. Uh, there is real progress. We have uh, begun to undertake uh, tens, if not uh, you know, many, many different activities uh, through the entire professional journey, and indeed journey from being a student at the university all the way through to retirement. So <clears throat> in terms of an analogy, I suppose I see it like, because I'm a doctor myself, when I think of health, I think of being healthy from top to toe, from head to toe in your body. In the same way, I make the analogy that within the university environment, uh, the equality agenda and diversity agenda is really about the entire journey from entering as a student or whatever level you enter as an undergraduate student, postgraduate student, or in any capacity in a job, all the way through to career progression. Uh, so it's about fair recruitment, it's about retention of good staff, and it's about making the journey uh, as pleasant and as successful for everyone as possible. So some examples, beacon activities that we have are paying attention to uh, why there might be attrition of women from career progression uh, and doing something about it. So for example, we have an excellent uh, return, uh, returning carers uh, scheme whereby the university has set aside a very generous pot of money to which uh, people can apply if they have taken a career break and so they can make a smooth transition when they come back. And of course, both women and men can apply for this, though largely we know it is women who take on those caring roles. So that's just one example. Other examples are requiring all staff to undertake equality and diversity training that raises consciousness of people to be fair and, and to be aware of equality issues. Uh, we have outreach schemes where staff members and students go out to schools. We take part in the science festival to raise all these issues about equality. Uh, we have mentoring schemes. Uh, we have lots and lots of different buzz of activities going on in terms of fair recruitment and retention and 
basically being able to achieve your very best while you're at Cambridge. Mm. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. People continue to ask the question when it comes to workplace and university diversity, is this just about us being good corporate citizens? Is this something that we can go back and report on and say that we are doing a good job? And does it really link in or does it really matter for the sake of organizational performance? Well, the answer to that is yes, it does. So we are seeing data-driven results more than ever before. And because of this, those in charge of corporate or university diversity programs are now being placed squarely in the hot seat to really explain why they're doing what they're doing and how this links to increased business and financial performance, as well as better decision-making processes. When it comes to women, particularly in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and maths, the other question here is how do we not only hire more women into these areas, but how do we retain them? And how do we ensure their promotion as they progress into the future? And then once again, data and results in this area become extremely important. As long as we can link increased performance to these initiatives at the outset, we'll see the business case for this continuing. Thank you for joining us and see you next time on Law Matters. Thank you.